speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. I just got back here last night from Toledo. Who has been to, to, to uh, Toledo here? Toledo. Toledo, vamos. Not talking about the city in Ohio, the, the real one, the historical capital. So one thing that I think of when I go to Toledo is the streets are crazy. Yeah, right? I've been there like four times over the years, and every time I get there, again, I'm just like, where are we? I think I know where we're going. Dead end. Right? I think I know. We're going to the cathedral. No, you're at the marketplace. Right? It's a crazy city because the map is really hard to figure out. And what I want to do today, briefly, not going to be a really long sermon, is to present a map of Holy Week. All of us have heard a lot of sermons about Palm Sunday. Excellent. We've all heard sermons about Good Friday, I'm guessing, and of course about Easter Sunday. But what other things happen during Holy Week? So we're going to take a tour of Holy Week. And you see this is called true crime. I've got to make a confession to you. One of my guilty pleasures in life is like true crime podcasts, movies, books, novels, TV shows, you name it. If it's true crime, I love it. So what is the crime that happens? Well, the crime is the plot to set up Jesus and to get the Romans to kill him. Have you ever thought why the Jews didn't just stone him? They would do that later on with Stephen. They had the authority to stone blasphemers. Well, they couldn't stone him because it was... It was well, what we call Holy Week or what they would call Pesach. So they didn't want to become ritually impure, so they had to make sure that some other Gentiles were the ones to carry it out. So, true crime. And let's figure out what are the things that Jesus did and said during Holy Week that led up to this terrible crime against humanity. The one person who was perfectly good, perfectly kind, who never sinned, and when... Empire and temple are confronted with this person, what do they do? Kill him. There we go. So Palm Sunday. Uh, I preached, I don't know, about a month or two ago, and somebody came to me and says, I really like your sermons. And I, I, oh, thanks be to God. Maybe I said something that connected with his mind and he understood scripture or something in his heart that made him love the Lord more. And he said... I like the art in your PowerPoints. And I said, you know what? I'll take what I can get. So Palm Sunday, the king enters his city. We already heard the wonderful reading that the children did. But I just want to focus in on one word, Hosanna. Hosanna. The the Hebrew word is Hoshana. And Hebrew, like Spanish, has the attached object. So it's salvanos, one word, right? Salva, hoshana, nos. Save us. It doesn't work well in English. Save us to the son of David. And there were people all around because there were so many pilgrims that had come in uh, to the holy city of Zion, of Jerusalem. And many of them asked, who is this man? And we already sung a version of Psalm 24, didn't we? Who, who can ascend to the hill of the Lord? Um, who is this? Who is this king of glory? It is the Lord God Almighty. And I'm sure that when we're mostly going to be sticking with Matthew uh, today. Matthew 21 through 25, that's all Holy Week. Do you know that we know more about the events and deeds of Jesus' life during that one week of his life than during the entirety of the rest of his life? I mean, so some, some people are like, well, emphasizing Holy Week, why would we do that? Well, the early Christians obviously thought it was profoundly important. So let's respect our elders, right? Uh, so we can learn from them. Hoshana. Now, obviously, they wanted to be saved from military and political dominance of the Roman Empire. And everybody would have been thinking of Psalm 24, of those prophecies that we read uh, from the prophet uh, Zechariah. You know, your king is coming and he's riding on a colt, right? He's not riding on a, on a p- powerful military steed. He's riding on a humble animal. And they want to be saved. Did you know that traditionally, in the churches that do Ash Wednesday with the imposition of ashes, they would save the palms from Palm Sunday the entire year, and then they would burn those palms, and those are the ashes that they use for the beginning of Lent. 
There's some profound theology there, but we don't, we're not going to do that today. <laughs> so they wanted to be saved. We, we sang this already, right? Who is this king of glory, the Lord of hosts? He is the king of glory. We think that Psalm 24 would have been a psalm that especially would have been used by the people of Israel when their king was returning, perhaps from a battle, or perhaps they were bringing in the Ark of the Covenant, which represents the presence of their king, of Yahweh, our Lord, the Lord of hosts. Um, but this would have been the, one of the psalms that was on the mind of everyone, which is so great that we did that song, which is based on this psalm. And here is, just to give you a little bit uh, of, of what Jerusalem is like, the walls of the old city of Jerusalem today are not the same as they were in the first century, but that part with the Temple Mount, that is actually relatively unchanged. So you'll see over there on the right-hand side, that's the Kidron Valley or the Valley of Kings. And that was the valley that Jesus would have come down and then gone up into where you see the temple there. You'll see on the southern part there is another valley called the Hinnom Valley. Gehinnom. This is where we get the word Gehenna, where that's the valley where they would throw out the trash and the flame would never end, right? But that's a different valley. So this is the Kidron Valley. And uh, I lived in Israel for five years and I've been all around Jerusalem many times. And I like the Kidron Valley because it's still relatively well pre- uh, preserved. Like a lot of the other places, you're like, okay, that's the Mount of Olives, and it's got a hospital and a university and hotels. And, I mean, it's pretty built up. But the Kidron Valley, you can still do that walk down the Kidron Valley and up. Uh, I'm not sure, we're not sure exactly which uh, gate Jesus entered, but there is to this day the Golden Gate. And it's the only gate of the old city in Jerusalem that is entirely blocked with Stones. It's also called the Mercy Gate. And it's because later on when the Muslims were ruling the city, they heard that the Jews thought this is the gate that the Messiah will come in through. And they thought, we know how to stop this (laughs) right from the get-go. So that whole golden gate, and there's also a a cemetery in front of it. That was another way to make it ritually impure. And uh, all of this is going on. So that is Palm Sunday. We find the entrance of the king. We find the people welcoming the king. It reminds us of how fickle the human heart is because later on we know that a lot of that loyalty and that that affection that they showed, um, for not not all of them would would it stay. Now, Holy Monday, this is the agenda of the king. This is the cleansing of the temple. Now, there's so much stuff that happens during Holy Week, but we don't really tend to think of it as being during Holy Week. So what goes on with the cleansing of the temple here? We have, uh, we saw this last weekend in our sermon too, two different Bible verses that don't seem to necessarily fit together, but here Jesus puts them together, a verse from Jeremiah and a verse from Isaiah. My house shall be called a house of prayer, that's from Isaiah, but you are making it a den of robbers. What was the fault? What was the problem? Is it necessarily unethical to change money? No. Is it unethical to sell sacrificial animals? No. What's the problem? They were doing this in the court of the Gentiles. The court of the Gentiles. Jesus is saying this court is part of God's design so that people from all over the world should be able to come up to the mountain of the Lord. People who are not Jews, people who are Greeks and Romans and Copts and Arabs and Persians and Iberians and fill in the blanks. And they can come over here And they will have a place to worship the Lord God. And they would listen and they would hear and learn the law of the Lord. But instead of that, instead of using the court of the Gentiles for its true purpose, they had turned it into a den of robbers. You really get this uh, from this section of Isaiah right here. It says, also the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to attend to his service and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath so as not to profane it and holds firmly to my covenant, even those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer, their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar. So that house of prayer, we hear about, oh yes, praying, that's an important thing. But specifically, if you read the whole passage from Isaiah, It is about having a house of prayer for the nations. And they had missed the boat. They had thought, oh, isn't it nice to be the elect people of God? 
thank you, God, that I'm not like those not elect people over there. Right? And Jesus is saying that is not it. So this is the agenda of the king. Over there, you have, uh, anyone want to guess who that man is? That's Abraham. What did the Lord, or Abram, what did the Lord promise to Abram? Through you and through your seed, all the nations, all the peoples of the earth shall be blessed. Jesus is not introducing a novelty or a new idea, but he's saying all the way back to Abraham, you're forgetting. You're forgetting what the purpose of that covenant was. So this was not a good way to make friends, right? And so we're not surprised that the following day, on Holy Tuesday, we find that the king is opposed. Now, during Holy Week, they stayed in the town of Bethany. That's the town where Lazarus, Mary, and Martha lived. It's roughly 10 kilometers away from Jerusalem. Today, it's a, it's a suburb um, of Jerusalem. Today, the actual Arabic name is al Lazaria, which means the town of Lazarus, roughly. So the, even to this day, that is still, um, that is still remembered. So Holy Tuesday, the king is opposed. And we have a bunch of different things going on on Holy Tuesday. We're not going to look at all of them. I do encourage you, sit down, read Matthew 20 through 25 uh, during during this Holy Week so you can really get a sense of all the difficulties and things that are going on. It's fascinating. But of course, one of the main things, these are called the temple disputes by most commentators, is they come to him and he had just cleared the temple out yesterday. He had regañar. He had rebuked all the people, Right? Uh, especially the people in authority. And so they ask him actually what is a quite reasonable question. By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you the right <laughs> to come in here and do this stuff? You're not one of the Sadducees. You're not one of the Romans. You're not, you know, someone from, you're not even from like an important family or an important city. Who gave you the right to do these things? And what is the response of Jesus. He says, I'll answer your question, but only if you answer my question first. And then this is the paraphrase of Dr. Miller. So again, go back and read it yourself. And he says, the baptism of John, was that from God or was that from man? You see, John, who had been there to prepare the way of the Lord, had done a really good job. And the people loved John. And even though John was dead by now, the people remembered the ministry and the power of John's preaching. And the people loved him. And they said, they, they get together, they huddle, and they're talking. And they say, well, we can't say it's from God because then Jesus will say, well, why don't you honor and obey John? But we can't say it's from men because we're afraid of the crowds. This is part of that perfect crime. It's not a perfect crime, but it's a crime. Part of that plot to kill Jesus. They couldn't do it when there were crowds, Right? The crowds were fascinated by Jesus. Even the little children, um, they they were fascinated by Jesus. Uh, They were impressed by him. Now, we didn't read from Matthew. I'm sorry, we read from Matthew, not from Luke. But over there, we have a painting of Jesus as a young man in the temple. And if we were reading Luke, we would remember this as well, right? That in his youth, Jesus was there with the teachers of the law, and they were impressed by him. So apparently they had a, a positive reaction to him. But here, we have something different. It's a contrast. We also have the parable of the wedding feast. The wedding feast is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. So go to the main roads and invite whomever you find there to be or to the wedding feast. For, for Jews in the first century, what does that mean? Go to the roads. Well, who is there at the roads? Probably a lot of Gentiles, right? Merchants coming and going, going up from Syria down to Egypt, parts of Arabia. So that would have, that would have challenged them. He's opposed about taxes. Should we pay taxes to Caesar? I mean, these are all the hot button questions that were supposed to get him into a lot of trouble. And what does he say? Bring me a coin. Bring me a denarius. This is where we get the word dinero, right? And um, he says, let, let me paraphrase it for you. This coin, in whose image and likeness is it made? Caesar. Those things that are made in the image and likeness of Caesar give to Caesar. Those things that are made in the image and likeness of God give to God. Do you see how powerful that is? What is made in the image and likeness of God? 
you, me. T.S. Eliot, the great uh, Anglican poet of the previous century, said, humility alone is endless. Um, I think that of all the virtues and the fruit of the spirit, the characteristics that we as Christians are called to foster, humility might just be the hardest one. Maybe, maybe not for everyone, but by and large, it's got to be really hard. So how do you think these scribes and Pharisees and teachers and priests, how do you think they felt when Jesus kept on responding to them in such a, an intelligent, scriptural manner? They, I'm sure they were, they were quite angry. Some of them maybe had ears to hear. We know that a good group of Pharisees became followers of Jesus from Acts. But obviously some of them did not. He was opposed about taxes. He was opposed about the resurrection. These were the Sadducees. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They had this whole thing of leveret marriage. Um, We'll talk about that some other time. But anyway, they were getting to Jesus on all these. And every group that went up to Jesus, they thought, ah, we've got it. We've got the trick. And all day long, he's engaging in these debates and these disputes in the temple. That is Holy Tuesday. And then on the way out, they're over there by the, on the Mount of Olives, and he gives what we call the Little Apocalypse, um, which is, you know, wars and rumors of war, famines, and people will say, here is the Messiah, but he is not there. And I'm going to leave a sermon on Matthew 24 for Pastor David, and we'll move on. Holy Tuesday, the king's new government. The king has been opposed, but the king has... A new government. And this is, this is kind of the, the main thing that really enraged the, uh, the leaders in Jerusalem. And he goes back to that concept of the stone that was rejected, which we talked about last week. A stone which the builders rejected. This has become the chief cornerstone. This comes about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And Jesus is saying to them very clearly, you all have rejected me, but in the work of the Lord, the plan of God is that I should become the chief cornerstone. And Matthew tells us, in, like, just in case you haven't understood this, I'm going to put in some narrative here, some commentary. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they understood that he was speaking about them. And though they sought to arrest him, they feared the crowds, since they considered him to be a prophet. How are they going to do this? They've got to get rid of this guy, but they can't do it there in the temple when everyone is around This chief priests and Pharisees, for us, that sounds fine. But I mean, imagine if you got the far left party and the far right party to say, this is so important, we're going to compromise and work together. (laughs) I'm not going to use the actual names of the parties, but you know what I'm talking about. That's what's going on here. Spy Wednesday. The kings are... how, How cool is that, right? Spy Wednesday. In Spanish, they're all just holy, right? But in English, we have some more variety. Spy Wednesday. The kings rest... On Wednesday, as far as we know, during Holy Week, Jesus stays in Bethany. And can you blame him? I mean, after Palm Sunday, after clearing the temple on Monday, and after these many long disputes on Tuesday, and I'm sure that there are several of them which are not even included in the Gospels, uh, he rests. He rests. This is the rest of the king. And that is a good thing. It is an example to us. I've known people, especially in ministry, that they're so busy serving the Lord that they never rest. And you know what happens? It's not good. It's not good. God designed us to be creatures who need rest. And so Jesus enjoys time with his friends, with his kind of spiritual family, if you will, uh, there in Bethany. But this is also the day when we think that Judas sneaks into Jerusalem, right? That's why it's called Spy Wednesday. Because there was a spy among them. The king is betrayed. And the spy goes in there. And Judas, he wants that money. Maybe he wants to force Jesus' hand. Maybe he's saying, and this is not in the Gospels, but this is the best hypothesis that I've ever heard. That, that Judas wants to force Jesus into that role of being that political savior that he wants. And that, frankly, a lot of people were waiting for And he thinks, if I can just get him arrested, then he's going to have no other option. He's He's going to be forced. He's going to be compelled to use these great miraculous powers that Judas has seen 
in order to get rid of the Romans and to reestablish that Davidic kingdom. Well, that is manipulating God. And uh, that is not a good thing to do ever. You can't force the hand of the Lord. This is also, uh, according to tradition, and the, mo- the most common understanding of uh, the time when his feet are anointed. So there is the betrayal of the king. I wonder how this artist felt when he was approached by the, you know, the bishop or the head of the church or whatever and said, I want, I want you to make a sculpture of Jesus and Judas and Judas going up to kiss Jesus. That must have been a powerful and influential thing in that man's life to to create this beautiful statue. And Jesus looks so sad. He gets what's going on. And there's Judas, right, acting like he really loves this man. Maundy Thursday, the king's struggle. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and praying said, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so you men could not keep watch with me for one hour. Keep watching and praying so that you do not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, this is after the institution of the Lord's Supper. This is the traditional thing that we celebrate on Maundy Thursday. Uh, Some churches will also do the washing of the feet because after the Lord's Supper, what did the Lord do? He dressed himself like a servant and he washed their feet. So um, I've been to churches that actually do literal washing of the feet on this day. You're going to get a great, uh, great sermon on this topic over at Primera Iglesia Bautista. So I'm not going to steal the thunder from the preacher over there. But then he is there in the Garden of Gethsemane the Garden of Gethsemane, and his closest allies and colleagues, the people that he loves, the people that he has been with, living with for years, they cannot even stay awake with him for an hour to pray. The king is struggling. He's got a very difficult path ahead of him. He knows it. But not my will, but yours be done. Do you know that this is basically what we pray when we say the Lord's Prayer? Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. I mean, sometimes we, we, if we say the Lord's Prayer often, which, you know, a lot of people, I think, say it on a regular basis, that's what we're praying. We're, we're uniting ourselves to Jesus and to that, that concern. The, the kingdom and the power and the glory, they're, they're not ours, right? Because that's how it ends. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Good Friday, the punishment of the king, question mark. Have you ever heard this story, this idea? Someone has to be punished. God in heaven doesn't want to punish you, so he's going to punish Jesus. We've heard this, but I'm going to tell you that's not what Matthew is saying at all. He is a sacrifice, an atoning sacrifice. But in Matthew, the king is ascending to his throne. He is ascending to, that's why he has a crown. It's a crown of thorns. The soldiers have bowed before him. They're making fun of him. It's in ridicule. But Matthew is saying, there's something going on here that goes beyond mere appearances. The king ascends to his throne. And when they came to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they gave him wine mixed with bile to drink, and after tasting it, he was unwilling to drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among themselves by casting lots, and sitting down, they began to keep watch over him there. And above his head, they put up the charge against him, which reads, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. The Roman Empire had acknowledged him as the king of the Jews, It's in one of the other Gospels, but the people come up to Pilate and they say, you know, he said he was the king of the Jews. And he's like, no, you know, you guys wanted to set him up for a political crime. We're going to we're going to go with this. It's my paraphrase of Pilate. But the king ascends to his throne. Holy Saturday. This is theologically the most controversial of the days. In Matthew, we don't have anything on Holy Saturday. 
His body is in the tomb all day Saturday. But what is happening on a spiritual level? Well, we have this verse from 1 Peter 3.18. It's not necessarily an easy verse. But um, the idea is that the soul of Christ went to Sheol, to the dead. Not hell of the damned, but to where the dead were awaiting. What the Old Testament calls the bosom of Abraham. In the New Testament as well. The bosom of Abraham. And they were waiting there for their Redeemer. I, we saying, I know that my Redeemer lives. For their Redeemer to break them out. And so this powerful king, he went there to the, to the gates of Sheol. And he busted them open. And he led the souls of the righteous. Who had been waiting for that mercy and that forgiveness of the new covenant. To, to bring them uh, into the presence of God. Well, what's the application? There you got seven different points. We've kind of zipped through Holy Week, right? But my hope is that we can live through Holy Week with Christ. Uh, St. Jerome said, to know Scripture is to know God. And I hope that as you have gotten a little introduction into the richness and the profundity of what happened during Holy Week, his betrayal by Judas on Wednesday. He was at Gethsemane. And of course, then they come, they arrest him. And they take him to these little trials throughout the night. Stuff that the crowds are not going to see. Stuff that are not very visible. And then they set him up for this crime. They can't kill him for blasphemy. Because then they wouldn't be able to do all their religious ceremonies, which are very important for them. So they set him up for a political crime, which he was not guilty of. That is what happened. Holy Week is about a triumphant king. Holy Week is about a triumphant king. We are his people. We are with him in his triumphs. We are with him in his struggles. We are with him as the king is opposed on Tuesday by people who think, oh, we, we know so much more than this, you know, this guy from the hills in northern Israel. We're there with him in his power, in his glory, entering into the city. We're there with him in his rest when he says, you know, Wednesday, I'm not even going to go to Jerusalem. I'm just going to hang out here in Bethany with my friends. Let us pray.